Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. You know, there's a ton of products on the market and new stuff popping up every day. On my social media feeds, I see ads for gardening products all the time that claim to be the best or something I absolutely need for my garden. So how do you sort through all the marketing hype and get to the bottom of what's really worth your time and money? I brought Suzanne Wainwright Evans back to help me with this podcast because she has a long background in both the cannabis industry and the horticulture industry. So she has really seen both sides and how different marketing is between the two industries. This podcast is really a discussion on how to evaluate products and what questions I think you should be asking as a grower when evaluating a product or inputs into your garden. From pesticides to compost, we cover it all in today's talk. Now, in case you missed the previous podcast with Suzanne, which are more focused on IPM and cannabis pests, she is an ornamental entomologist specializing in integrated pest management. She's been involved in the green industry for more than 25 years with a primary focus on biological control and using pesticides properly. She is a graduate of the University of Florida with degrees in both entomology and environmental horticulture. She has worked throughout the United States and internationally consulting to greenhouses, nurseries, landscapers, and interior scape companies. She is the owner of Bug Lady Consulting, now in business for over 16 years. Hey, Suzanne, really appreciate you coming back on the show. I'm excited to have you on again. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be able to do this, and it's always a pleasure to be able to talk with you. Well, you know, you and I have talked a lot off the air about a variety of uh, products and how to evaluate products and how to look at biocontrols and pesticides. And uh, you actually had me come down to uh, the biocontrols conference to give a talk on exactly this subject. And I just thought it was so important that we uh, might want to cover it on the podcast. So uh, thank you for doing this. Well, and let me, let me this... cut in because I, I'm going to say it again. That was a phenomenal presentation you did. And anybody that missed it really missed out. And I'm really, once everybody gets to go back to meetings and conferences, don't think I'm not going to be pushing for you to do that same talk at other events because I think you had a really, really good message, and it was great information. I heard nothing but amazing things about it. So thank you for coming and doing that. Wow. Well, thank you. I was super nervous, <laughs> so I'm glad that it went it went pretty well. Um, yeah, public speaking is, is tough for me, but uh, I'm glad I got to do it. It was a wonderful opportunity right before this whole pandemic hit. Um, but to, to really dive in on this topic, just to keep things moving, I kind of want to talk about a general overview of how we evaluate a product. And then I want to talk more specifically with you about um, how do we evaluate you know, media, soil and compost? How do we evaluate nutrients? And then really your wheelhouse, how do we evaluate pesticides and biocontrols in general? So, um, and microbial inputs, things like that. So talking from a general overview, I want to just highlight a few points. And then uh, if you want to just jump in with any suggestions, thoughts as we go along. That would be great. So if we're talking about a product in general, the first thing I want to say is that there's no such thing as a good product. Uh, there is such thing as a bad product for your garden. Uh, there's a lot of snake oil products out there, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this podcast uh, in particular. But in terms of a good product, I hear people all the time like, hey, you know, my buddy's using product X in their garden. I need to get products X in my garden. Or what do you think about, I get quest emails like, hey, should I add product X into my, into my regimen? And, and my question or my response to them is really like, well, what's in the product and what, what does your garden actually need? Because I think this is an important thing to, to really highlight at the beginning is like, for example, if we're talking about nutrients, if your plant is, if, or your soil is lacking nitrogen and you add a product that has nitrogen in it, you're going to get a good plant response. It was a good product to apply and you're going to have um, a healthier plant. However, if your soil already has sufficient levels of nutrients or nitrogen in this case, by adding more nitrogen, you're not actually going to be improving the quality of your soil, the healthier plant, and you could actually cause toxicities and other problems. So that's, I guess, what I want to get at when I say there's no such thing as a good product. Um, we really have to look at our garden holistically and make a determination based on what the limiting factors of growth are uh, for our plant. Um, do you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, no, I agree because, I mean, you can have, you know, the best products 
in a way in the world, but if your plants don't need them, there's, you know, no point in using them because I get that too. People ask all the time, you know, product X, you know, should I be spraying this? And my question is, do you need it? Um, and just because, you know, that a product may work well in a particular pest or resolve a particular nutritional issue, only if your crop needs it, is it necessary? Um, so I, I think you're, you're dead on there and it's an important to evaluate um, if, if those products actually do what they claim because I see a lot of claims on a lot of products, um, thus, you know, part of the, the tinfoil hat issue um, and without any science to back them up, um, which, you know, is, is a very important part of trying to decide if you need a product or not. Yes, I completely agree with that. And that actually brings up my next sort of thing. I put together a list of just kind of like a few different things that I wanted to highlight that I kind of keep in my head whenever I'm thinking about any product uh, and potentially adding it to my garden. Uh, and some of these questions are, are sort of the following here. Like one, what are the ingredients? You know, are they using high quality inputs? Uh, what's the manufacturing or processes involved? And if they tell me it's proprietary, that's my first red flag. Most people are willing to share, if they're legitimate, at least some of what's going on uh, with the product that they're making. Um, if, and if they don't understand the mechanism of action, like uh, I've had some people in regarding, uh, you know, adding sea salt, you know, some of these uh, salt-based sodium products that where they're harvesting, you know, salt out of the middle of the ocean or seawater out of the middle of the, middle of the ocean. I say, why? Why do I want to be adding this to my garden? And they're not able to give me, you know, a really s solid answer. Uh, that's something I really struggle with. Or they're not willing to tell me, you know, exactly how they're manufacturing. It's a special process that they can't share because it would give everything away. Uh, th those are, that's just a, a big red flag for me. Right. Do you want to touch on that on before I mention the next one? Yeah. And, you know, from a pest management standpoint, from um, pesticides, and if it kills a pest, it is a pesticide. So and oils and all that are pesticides. Pesticides is not necessarily a bad word. But if the products are EPA registered for their active ingredient in the product, the active means that's, that's the part of the product that gets the work done, they have to list what it is because that way you know exactly what you're applying to the plant. Now there are inerts in there and those often are the carriers which could be you know different powders, talcs, clay, uh, oils, and things like that. They don't necessarily have to give you all the inert information, but you can find a lot of the information like on MSDS sheets and things like that. But that's one of the reasons why it, I'm a little lean more towards some of the EPA registered products is because they, they have to be a bit more forthcoming with you about what's, what's in the product. Um, Sometimes you're not necessarily going to be able to find out all the manufacturing um, uh, uh, methods. Um, and, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who um, she works at a fertilizer manufacturing company. And she said that for their fertilizer input, before they'll even offload the inerts um, to the factory or the, the input products, they're heavy metal testing the products right on the truck to make sure that even before they unload, there's no heavy metals in it to make sure purity of the product. And, you know, companies telling you do, they're doing things like that really make you feel better about using those products. And they do have set standards. Totally. That, uh, I think that is important. And just to, get, to give an example of what you mentioned, like, for example, uh, the first thing I thought of, and I know you're not a huge fan of it, but is neem oil. Uh, there we're talking about an active ingredient of azadiractin. It's also, you know, no. there's derivatives like azanax, right? No. That, Isn't that? No. And neem oil, the active ingredient is neem oil. In um, oh. The azadiractin is a derivative that comes from the neem plant. Also, that's not really an oil. That's an insect growth regulator. Um, so there's actually two products that come out of the neem. Well, there's lots of products that come out of the neem tree, but as far as, you know, plants are concerned you know you basically have neem oil which is a suffocant and also has a repelling quality and then you have azadiractin which is the active in uh, you know there's i don't know like 10 15 different products on the market now they they have azamax azatrol yeah now 
when you say that, so does so that would neem oil have to without getting off on a tangent? Would neem oil have to list as a directant as an active ingredient if it's EPA certified? No, because or registered? the as a directant, to my understanding, has been removed out of it because again, it's an oil you're spraying, not an insect growth regulator with the neem product. It is a suffocant. They're two different things. They're splitting what they're getting out of the plants apart. Because hmm. I've seen as a directant levels on tests of neem based products it could be uh, that as part of the testing it could that could happen and this is the neem's been very inconsistent um there's been you know i don't want to say issues makes it sound bad but you know the it, it's i would say it's a pretty inconsistent product because it is it's it's a botanical because it's coming from a plant and the harvesting methods and the plants themselves can be different you know what where they're grown, how they're, you know, raised, just like how uh, cannabis is a perfect example. You know, you uh, extract from cannabis and how it's grown, you get different compounds out of it. So it's possible there's traces of it in there, but it's not sold as an azadiractin product. That's a separate product in itself. Also, you know, there could be, because there has been these contamination issues with the neem oils, with the other synthetic pesticides, it's possible there could be some azadiractin uh, contamination potentially happening too at the processing facility. Hmm, that's interesting. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't aware of that distinction between the two. So that's, uh, yeah. that's good. I learned something new. Because <laughs> you look at the label and you look at what the active is and either it will say neem oil or it will say azadiractin. And so like azadiractin being an insect growth regulator, what that does is that it regulates the growth of insects. So it prevents them from being able to basically molt into their next life stage. And so it works very well on immature insects where if you've got a whole bunch of adult insects, azadiractin really isn't necessarily great for that, where neem oil working as a suffocant would be. Got it. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. And uh, moving on to my second point here is one you kind of already mentioned, uh, is the product certified? So is it registered as organic, EPA certified? Is it registered as a fertilizer? Uh, you know, with living soils, we don't have that requirement. However, I know my company, we chose to, to do that registration because of the amount of nutrients that we're putting into our soil. And that, that registration or level of certification requires a lot more reporting. It requires heavy metal testing. It requires me to put an MPK level on my bag. Um, and by taking it a step further and getting certifi certified organic, um, you know, they're tracing everything, all of my inputs all the way back. So there's someone out there that knows my recipe with the, you know, organic certification and is verifying that the inputs are organic, that they're all registered, that they're uh, allowed for use in organic production. Um, so while it's not a perfect system because someone could, you know, go through all of this and then still throw in an ingredient that you're not allowed to use, um, Guardian Mite Spray would be a great example of that on the pesticide side. Yep. There is at least some level of oversight and regulation around the product uh, and, and testing. So, you know, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, WSDA here in Washington will go out off of a shelf and pull a product and, you know, check the weight on it, check the label, make sure everything's correct, uh, do a nutrient analysis and make sure that what is being claimed on the label matches up with what you're actually receiving in the bottle or in the box or in the soil. So uh, having a product certified is just one more level of protection. It's not the end all be all. Um, as I mentioned, but it is something to consider. And uh, do you want to touch a little bit about what that EPA registration is? Because I think this is one of the really important points around uh, pesticides with sort of uh, what type of registration that they're able to get or what they have around a product. Well, it used to be uh, that if you claimed any pesticide uh, activity, like if you said, my product kills aphid, my product kills mites, my product kills rats, even the rodenticides fall under pesticides. By law, you had to have it registered with the EPA. Um, and, you know, each state then reviews labels because you'll see with pesticides, like the label in California can be different than New York, or you can have products we can use in Florida, but then we can't use them in New York. So then on top of it, each state, you know, kind of looks at the product and makes decisions on it too. But about, oh, I'm trying to remember the exact year, maybe about 10 years ago, and I should know this off the top of my head, um, uh, the federal government said, listen, 
you know, there's certain products out there, you know, rosemary oil is a really good example. We know it has pesticidal properties, but we also know it's pretty safe for humans because um, it's in a lot of cosmetics, it's in food, it's in a bunch of different stuff. So if people are using it and we know it's safe, you know, then we're not going to require you to register a product if that's the active ingredient in it. And there's a list um, from uh, the EPA, if you go, the 25, uh, 25B list is one of the names they call it. Um, but it's basically you have these exempt inputs. And it, the thing is, again, all that means is those products are safe for humans. It doesn't mean that they're good miticides or insecticides or are safe for plants by any stretch of the imagination. But with the cannabis industry really kicking up over the last few years and people looking for products, um, there has been this flood to the market of, of these products that are not EPA registered. And it's been a very much buyer beware situation because we don't always know what's in them. There's really not a lot of oversight federally um, on them. And when you contact these companies and say, okay, do you have any trial data? Do you have any, and it's, it's really hard to get specific information where when you have something EPA registered, um, there, you can definitely get a lot more information on the product because there's such higher requirements through the EPA to get a product registered. And it takes years and years. There's lots of testing. And now, you know, they have to do all this B testing now uh, to make sure your product's going to be safe for bees, but the, those exempt products um, don't have to go through any of that rigorous testing. And so that's where you can really see the, the differences out there. Um, but the, the cannabis industry has really exploded with these exempt products. That is the perfect lead into the next question that I keep in my head, which is, is the product found outside of the cannabis industry? Do you want to explain why that might be an important uh, variable to consider when you're looking at a product? Yeah, so um, I say this all the time to in my presentations that when you look at, let's say, poinsettia growers, their profit margins are so low on poinsettia, sometimes just a few pennies a pot, that they can't afford to use products um, that don't work. And so I always say to my cannabis guys, you know, these, all these wonderful cannabis products, why aren't other industries really using them? And, uh, you know, from what I, my experience has been and what we've tested is because a lot of times they don't work that well. Um, and also the, the, the ability to get information on a product that is EPA registered as a company. I mean, there's just so much more information available for these EPA registered products. Um, I, I don't see my non-cannabis growers using many of these non-EPA registered products because, again, they can't get the information, they can't get trial information, and, again, sometimes it's a mystery to what's really in there. And also, a lot of them are botanical oils, which can be um, highly phytotoxic, um, and that's another big concern. Um, yes, with EPA registered products, of course, you can have phytotoxicity, but because of liability reasons, um, the companies do a lot of thorough testing and generally the labels will tell you exactly what you can and cannot use products on to uh, prevent lawsuits because I have seen lawsuits where people have sprayed a product, it's killed the crop and then they've sued the manufacturer of the product. And I have a feeling one of these days this is gonna happen in the cannabis industry. Um, right now, I haven't heard of any things like that happening, but I've absolutely seen it happen in uh, the ornamental market. So I, I guess that brings up some questions for me around uh, phytotoxicity. Have you seen a lot of, you, you mentioned botanical air, uh, oils when you talk about phytotoxicity. Is there anything you can share around that that might be a warning to listeners um, in terms of potential active ingredients that might be more likely to cause phytotoxicity? Well, but it's hard to know because sometimes they don't break down the concentrations of what's in the product. Um, I think sometimes they do that because if you really knew that, you know, this particular bottle of product you just paid $100 for has, you know, 1% rosemary and, you know, half a percent thyme and, 
you know, 1% garlic extract. So really there's about three, $3 maybe of active ingredient in there. You, they can, you can understand what the markup on these products are. Um, so, and also I understand that people are trying to make a competitive product and you don't want to hand your formula to somebody else. Um, so, you know, even with any EPA registered product, when a new product comes to market with my ornamental growers, we always do trials first. First, is it safe for the plant? Do we see any phytotoxicity? And second, does it actually do what it says it does? Um, we do have the advantage that, you know, a lot of the universities uh, do trial these EPA registered products for ornamentals and vegetables. So we have that as a resource. I'm hoping down the road because a lot of the land grant universities are now working on hemp. Uh, we can get more trial work, you know, th through that avenue. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's, it's tough for the growers and, it, and it's tough for the growers to know if the claims are really true or not. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that makes me just want to bang my head on the wall is when I see people all the time promoting, you know, their amazing unicorn tear pesticide only kills pests like hemp russet mite, but it's absolutely safe for your beneficials. It just doesn't work that way. Now, some of the synthetic chemistries, which can't be used in cannabis and hemp at this time, we actually do have some very, very targeted pesticides that work on very particular, very specific metabolic pathways. Um, there's a one miticide that's made by BASF that that's pretty safe with most beneficials and we can actually spray it over top of predatory mites, but it absolutely smokes two spot spider mites, immatures, adults and eggs. So in the synthetic world, we do have some pretty good products like that. But when it comes to the non EPA registered stuff, which almost all are killing more as a suffocant or a desiccant, it's their broad spectrum products. And so they're going to be non selective. And again, with, with soaps and oils, you have to be very careful of particle size um, because again, of a, a phytotoxicity uh, and actually will they kill? And it's kind of interesting to look too um, at the differences between the oils because rosemary oil, um, which has been abused a bit more, and there's some products that have been trying to go mainstream. Um, the limitation there is cost because rosemary oil is very expensive and it, it can be a good alternative because there's no REI or reentry interval with it. So you can spray it and your workers can go back to work. But what's interesting is rosemary oil does not work well on like spider mite eggs where the uh, petroleum oils, the paraffinatic oils, they smoke spider mite eggs. So not all oils are the same and they all do not perform the same out in the field. Well, that, that kind of touched on the next uh, point that I had here, which was what testing and research do you have to support the claims that uh, they're making around the product? And what of that research are they willing to share with you? Um, I think that's really imp important that we ask those questions and then be very, very uh, critical of what responses we get back. Um, critical in the sense of that we're, we're really evaluating what they're saying and not getting overwhelmed by, you know, quote unquote science. So I had, I had a guy uh, recently that was making a claim about how they're their microbial product uh, create, made up for low light conditions. And so I reached out to him, I said, do you have research on this? And he sent me uh, an encyclopedia on quantum physics and said that this answered it. And I, I was like, this, this has nothing to do with what you're claiming. And it was very scientific looking, but uh, again, had nothing to do with actually answering or, or supporting the claim that they were making. And uh, this is a really time consuming part of it. But if we're talking about adding something into our garden, I think it's critical that we spend the time to really research what we're doing. And, you know, obviously having peer review research is really nice, but that's difficult when we start talking about the cannabis industry. We don't have that. You know, a lot of it is anecdotal, uh, you know, experiential, um, word of mouth. Uh, there is some research more and more coming out daily. And like you mentioned, there's research on other crops that doesn't necessarily cross over perfectly, but it will at least give us a trend or an indication as to the quality of a product. But um, 
how do you evaluate, uh, you know, research yourself? If you want to look at, not so much if you want to test it out yourself, because I want to, that's my next one I want to talk about. But if you wanted to look at what body of research existed about a product, let's take, you know, pesticide X. Um, where would you start in that sort of like testing research, supporting the claims uh, world um, online or, or through your contacts? Well, I mean, I always, you know, want to dissect the product and know, again, what the actives in it, what, you know, what's in the product, because, you know, if you look at a product and let's just say product X is, well, just since we've been talking about rosemary and I'm not picking on rosemary oil because it can be a very good product in the right application, but, you know, okay, we now, we know it contains rosemary oil. Um, well, then I want to go look and see what research has been done on rosemary because, you know, you mentioned how there's not a lot of research done on, uh, you know, cannabis crops. Believe it or not, on some of the ornamental crops, there's not a lot of research either. Um, and where a lot of research is done is on food crops. And so I kind of have to go to food crop research and see what I can extract out of that to see how it applies to what I'm actually working on. And so I do what's called, you know, a literature search where you do a search for research papers that have been published. And I tend to look at like active ingredients um, of, you know, what's the active in there. So I'm going to look for, you know, any research on rosemary oil and see what's been done around the world on rosemary oil. And then the other thing that I look at that's really important is how is the research done? Because we all know if you want a particular answer, you can skew the way you do things to make it happen a certain way. Um, I, I, I think that um, how pesticides are applied is really important because a lot of pests can just be blown off a plant with a spray of water. And so if you're, you know, you're doing a trial and you have like, you're only doing four plants um, and those plants are getting sprayed with the active but with a good jet of water, how do you know it's not the mechanical means removing those pests? And I've had some questions about some, you know, pesticides that, you know, is it the spraying action that removed the pest or was it the actual active ingredient? And that's why um, when researchers today do research on the microbial products, products that contain like Bavaria and Isaria and Metarizium and things like that, these beneficial fungus, what they actually do is they isolate the fungus out of the commercial products so it's a 100% pure product and there are no inerts to make sure that they're applying just the straight active ingredient. Companies typically will not just provide the straight active ingredient. So for the microbials, they actually have to isolate it out um, and, and look at it that way. But how they do the applications is, is very important too. And that's the kind of stuff I look at to see like, okay, does this make sense? Also, you have to look at, again, how the research is done because if it is done, but again, they're testing four plants in you know, a research greenhouse, the way they did that, can it be ramped up to five acres or 10 acres? And sometimes it can't because oftentimes researchers aren't looking at the economics of doing something for pest management and how much it's gonna cost in labor and the reality of spray coverage, because again, research greenhouses, they're all nice and spaced out and you can get full coverage from every side and you can take time to spray everything where you go to any commercial facility and people are just like running down the aisles trying to spray as fast as they can and you don't get the same kind of spray coverage. And, and this is why sometimes you can get one result in research and another in real world because of application differences, how much water is used, there's so many variables, but we need the research. We need it from a starting point because if, you know, let's just say rosemary oil was sprayed and they saw no efficacy at all under ideal conditions, well, then it's probably not going to work under sub-ideal conditions in a commercial growing facility. And so generally that's where I start. And then, you know, I, I pick up my, you know, little bug phone and I call my, you know, university friends and other, you know, uh, people I know that, you know, have worked in the industry for a long time with science background. And when we talk about, you know, what are we seeing? Because, you know, kind of the proof is in the pudding once stuff gets out to the field, whether it's going to work or not. 
And then, you know, looking at all of that, kind of make decisions on if, you know, it's a product I should recommend or not. But I tell you, with the products that are targeting specific for the cannabis industry, it's nearly impossible to get like solid research from the companies saying, here's the trial, here's the protocol we used, and here's our results. It's, it's, it's very difficult to get that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I remember in my talk, I, I went to a particular website of a, a pretty famous cannabis nutrient company that I won't mention here on the podcast. And they had these charts that were just incredible. You know, product X causes 75% better growth and is reported by master growers to produce, you know, 50% better trichome density, you know, or, or some, some ridiculous number. But then they have no uh, reference to the actual study that they conducted. And when you write to them and ask them for it, they say that that's proprietary. Well, that research really isn't useful. It, it probably doesn't even exist. But they had a cool bar graph, you know, supposedly supporting it. And w when you're looking at research, that's it's so tough. Because like you said, you actually have to look at it. You know, it may have been a researcher that had four tents up, you know, in a controlled environment. And like you said, four plants or even, even 20 plants. That's a really low end value. The statistical power of that is, relatively speaking, is, is fairly low. And we want to see it replicated. That's the thing about these trials is um, we can't draw huge conclusions from that. We can say, well, this shows a trend. There's a likelihood that because of this research, we're going to get similar results but too many times i see people conclusively cite research and and say that you know this causes this to happen and we really have to be cautious with that um, and we really have to read the research really carefully and like you mentioned the application method the application rate um, on on the soil and nutrient side when we talk about those sort of things we have to look at what was already existing in the soil um, you know, what kind of plants are they growing in there? You know, what, there, there's just so many things we have to consider uh, before we draw like any hard conclusions. So well, and, assuming and, we get through this testing and research. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add, I think one of the most classic, you know, we think we know the answer and oh my gosh, we were wrong kind of thing. And yeah, I know the cannabis industry, you know, you guys don't use that metacloprid. Please don't send me hate mail because I said a metacloprid, but it's a really good example of how research can be done by good people doing good things, but can be wrong because of replications. And what the situation was when a metacloprid, um, it was being used to uh, treat pests in uh, the state of New York on a lot of par uh, central, the trees in central parks and things like that. And what was interesting is they started to notice trees that were treated with a metacloprid had a flare up of spider mites afterwards that if you treat with metacloprid, boom, those plants ended up with spider mites. And everybody went to the conclusion that, well, because the metacloprid is a systemic, that a lot of beneficials, in, in addition to eating the meat of the insects, they're also plant feeders, pollen and nectar, or they drink plant juices. And so that they assumed that the metacloprid was killing the beneficials. And this is what was said for a while until they started looking, going back and looking closer. And what they actually found is, yes, a metacloprid can kill some beneficials, but that's not what was causing this. They found that the plants treated with a metacloprid actually were basically more nutritious and that the spider mites that were feeding on these plants were like super spider mites. It was like getting super vitamins. And they were, the females were actually laying more eggs and being much more productive. And so it was just like a, a metacloprid triggered the plant to feed the spider mites better. And so it seemed like at first a metacloprid was, you know, killing the beneficials. And that was why we had the mite issues, but it wasn't. And so that's why we need replications over and over stuff. Stuff has to be peer reviewed. You need a lot of people putting input in on this. And, you know, some great work. University of Maryland was heavily involved with that. And they did some great work on that. And, it, and, and this is what's hard is because it takes years to figure this stuff out. And you have a grower standing there saying, my plants are dying uh, right now. I need an answer now. And so it's, it's very difficult. And with the lack of funding going to research, the lack of researchers, it's going to get nothing but harder and harder to get this good information um, out there. So 
it makes me cringe when people say, oh, I had this pest issue, I just sprayed this, and it totally went away, when the product to me in my head doesn't make sense. And, uh, you know, there could be other things going on that the growers aren't even aware of. That's a good example. I hadn't heard that one. I'm not, I'm not very familiar with, like, traditional chemistry, so it's, it's cool to hear that. But that really does highlight the point that uh, we're trying to make. Um, but let's just assume that we get through all of this process and you're like, you know, I still want to give this product a shot. Um, that's where it comes to testing it out using controls and determining if the product is valid. Can you talk a little bit about how you would set up a trial or a test? Um, let's just say in a really small grow, just to make it simple. Um, how, would you, how would you isolate for a product X to determine if it, it is a controlling variable or not? Well, and this is challenging because, I mean, I think growers need to test products, don't get me wrong, and many of my larger greenhouse facilities, they actually have their own in-house research people to do this stuff, but most cannabis facilities don't. Um, the problem is, is oftentimes, because the plants are so valuable in cannabis, you can't afford to sacrifice, you know, five plants and just say, hey, we're not going to treat these plants where with poinsettias and mums, it's super easy to sacrifice a few plants. So that creates a challenge in itself. Um, also, if those plants, um, if you're not treating them, they can become a problem for the pest and you know, all of a sudden your pest numbers spike on those plants and spread to other plants. Now you can cage plants. Um, and this is something that's often done. I've got, you know, like a dozen cages here at my house that I put plants in. Um, they have little, you know, zip windows on them. Um, if you ever need them, you get them from BioQuip out in California. And what you can do is you can put your plants inside of there and then you zip them closed. And that way they're isolated because what one of the biggest problems you have when, you know, let's say you have a plant covered with aphids and you want to test if products X will kill them. What happens if ladybugs show up? What happens if lace wings show up? What happens if a natural occurring fungus show up? And, and that can really mess your trial up. And so the cages will help exclude beneficials from getting in there, but it also can create a microclimate when you're treating those plants. Um, so it, it, it can be challenging. Um, I think that with growers, if they have a good out and a good pest management program, you know, they can tag certain plants they're not going to treat and then tag certain plants they are going to treat, but they have to be under the same environmental conditions. They have to be on the same nutrients. I mean, they have to be identical in all ways to see if the product's going to work for them. Um, but it's very difficult if you're going to go spray these plants, but not those over there, spray drift, because spray drift, um, Pesticides drift further than people often realize, and so that can be very challenging. And, and, and this is why a lot of people just are like, well, let the universities do the work, and then, you know, because they've got the setup. They have research greenhouses. They have growth chambers. They have all this isolated stuff to be able to do this. But, again, in the, in the cannabis situation, it's, it's not so easy. Um, you need to watch the hemp research. Because, you know, Virginia Tech's doing a lot on hemp. Colorado State's doing a lot on hemp. Cornell has gotten a chunk of money to do research on hemp. And, you know, there will be papers being published coming out on that from um, those universities. But as far as a grower setting a trial, I mean, I hate to say it, but I don't think most cannabis growers are in a position to necessarily test products without really focusing on that and maybe having an isolated area to do it in um, or to be able to space their plants out because cannabis growers tend to grow really tight. And, you know, if, if your plants are touching and one's getting sprayed and one's not, again, the pesticide is going to end up on the other one. Um, you can, let's say you wanted to te test a product for spider mites, let's say. And if you have several infected leaves, and you can kind of look at those leaves and then if you carefully spray them with the pesticide product and then wait 24 hours and come back and look, you can get an idea of what's going on. But what's difficult about that is think about if you're just going to spray one leaf compared to spraying a plant and you're going to end up with a lot more active ingredient on that leaf than you would if you're spraying a whole plant. And so it kind of skews, 
you know, the reality of how you really spray compared to a, a trial spray there. So that's, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, I think the biggest mistake growers make is they don't assess well after they use a product and report back what they see, you know, before they spray, you know, if they found, let's say, 10 spider mite eggs per leaf, they come through, they spray product X, and they come back. If those eggs have hatched out in a few days, then the product didn't work. If the eggs are dead, well, then you know the product worked. So it's that follow-up and scouting after you've done treatments, I think is really critical. And using the sticky cards to monitor numbers will really help evaluate a product. I know that was a lot. And I'm sorry. <laughs> No, it's it's interesting because I don't look at it from a, a pest perspective like you do. So I'm, that's why I'm glad I'm I'm doing this podcast with you. Uh, one other factor or variable I want to mention with specific, specifically with pesticides is the uh, sprayer itself. Yep. Um, that's a whole world too in terms of particle size and and dispersion and oh all of that. I mean, what a nightmare. Um, yeah, I think it was so, Michael Brownbridge. I'm not sure. If, I think he said this on one of the webinars we did. You know where you know you can have um a, a bad product and a good sprayer and it's not going to work but if you have a good product and a bad sprayer it's definitely not going to work so uh, the sprayers can make all the difference in the world and i've had several people tell me that once they've gone from paint sprayers cement sprayers you know the home depot special backpack sprayer to you know commercial sprayers with the right nozzles it's made it's made their products work that much better, especially with the horticultural oils, because you can't have big, gloppy, droppy particles. You need a fine, almost aerosol mist on those leaves with the oils. So let's just say that testing out pesticides is, has numerous challenges for the average person um, or average grower. Uh, just to simplify this point, though, uh, I'm going to pick something like lighting, for example. So let's say we wanted to compare four different types of lighting. We could throw, you know, 10 to 15 plants under a particular brand of double-ended HPS lights, another one under um, a particular LED brand, and, and vice versa, and keep them in separate, you know, in separate tents or separate rooms to where the all all the plants are exactly the same, which means we're running the exact same cultivar. We can't compare different cultivars and then do a yield comparison at the end because that's not going to be accurate. They need to be cloned plants if we want to talk about them being genetically identical and of identical health and identical height. And then, you know, a good scientific experiment would actually randomize those clones. So you wouldn't say, oh, these five are going to go into this, you know, into this under this light. You would actually do a, a random number generator and give each plant a number and then pull those out that way and do it to really randomize things as much as possible. And then, uh, all the, you know, everything would be the same across the board. And then assuming you've controlled for all those variables, that would at least give you an idea that your plants are going to yield a pro this particular cultivar. We can't even make assumptions across a variety of cultivars, right. you know, would yield a certain amount or have this level of health or this level of growth under this particular light or lighting spectrum. And, you know, even with a simple example like that, it gets challenging because, well, you know, with a double-ended HPS light, you're going to have different heat requirements. So that's going to change the environment of the room, uh, which is going to have to be accounted for. We can't just assume that all the rooms are going to need the exact same requirements based on the lighting. And, you know, just trying to pick the simplest of examples, um, you can find it's quite challenging. And when we start looking at, you know, uh, bottled nutrients or our fertilizers, we have to know what's in the media already so we know our starting point. And if we're starting from a completely inert media like rock wool, for example, that makes it quite easy. But on the organic side, that's not really ideal. Um, and so then we have to start looking at, you know, adding this product. Is it actually, is it making a difference? Is everything else the same? And then we, you know, we have a program that's our, you know, sort of our, our control. And then we add product X to a certain number of plants. Uh, and, and we get this sort of a response. And based on that response, then I would go back again and test it again and say, okay, well, was it this, what was the, the controlling mechanism of action in this product that made this occur? Or was it something really specific to this product? Was it adding nitrogen, phosphorus, whatever macro, micronutrient? And then I would try another experiment adding just 
that, that micro or macronutrient to see if I can do it more affordably or get that same response to know if it really is the product or really is a particular nutrient that's a limiting factor in my grow. So it, 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 it's sort of this never ending, uh, <laughs> fairly sophisticated uh, way of thinking that will allow you to improve your garden, but also sort of get a better idea of how a product is performing for you. Right. And, and, you know, you'll, it's easy, I don't want to say it's easy, but, you know, historically, it's easier to find research on, let's say, I will call a soil with no microbial or nutrient activity, like rock wool. Um, and to do nutrient research on that is way easier because, as you mentioned, all the variables that go into a living soil because is there a microbe eating another microbe that processes this other nutrient that then is binding something up? And it's so complex. And that's why with the biocontrol, you see way more pesticide trials because, you know, here's a leaf, spray it. Is the bug dead? Yes. When it comes to biocontrol, it's so complex because, you know, if you have I think a classic example is a row beetle. Okay. Here you've got a row beetle. And, you know, on its normal day at work, it's cruising through the soil and it's like, oh, I like to eat fungus gnats and oh, I like to eat thrips pupa. And, you know, it's still kind of this weird thing about root aphids because I've seen people put buckets of them out and they still have massive root aphids. But if you were to take that row beetle and starve it for 24 hours and put it in a petri dish under a, you know, trial setting and throw some root aphids in there, it will eat it. And so what it does in a Petri dish, these living organisms in this sterile environment is going to be different than what happens out in these living systems. And so that's why some of the research that is done, and that's why I always look to see how it's done, you know, if, if are they given a food choice and, you know, if you saw it eat in the Petri dish, does that really mean it's going to go eat it out in the wild when it's given all these other things to feed on. So again, this is why it's important to understand how the research is actually done, not just did it kill it or not. Because I've seen a lot of expensive, I don't know if the word's mistakes, but a lot of people using products um, that we knew weren't going to work in a growing grower setting, even though they got results under a controlled lab setting. So it's very important to look and see how they've done that research. And even though, you know, microbes aren't necessarily getting up and walking away kind of thing, they are a living thing that interacts with the environment around it. Yeah, th that brings up a, a good point. Um, and the way I'd like to highlight this point is actually kind of funny because it's sort of how I met you. Uh, it was at uh, PhotoX and we were talking, I don't, I don't, think I brought it up, but somehow we got on the topic of compost teas. And uh, I know that that was sort of a, maybe it still is a little bit of a, of a trigger for you in some ways, because I know there's a lot of claims being out there, uh, out there being made about compost teas that are just frankly not accurate, you know, and especially things relating to insects and bugs, like I sprayed compost tea and now my soil, I, you know, I did a drench, I no longer have fusarium or I no longer have pests. It repels the pests or makes the plant so healthy that it's now immune to pests or, you know, a variety of things. And for you, I realized that that is uh, obviously something that would would set you off or, or you don't like to hear. I'm, I don't and, want to say I'm set off. You <laughs> make me sound like I'm a crazy lady. No, 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 no. I just, I remember when you, you met me, I, somehow you found out that I had something to do with compost teas. And I remember having it being, we had a longer, it actually was good because it sparked a longer conversation where I got to explain to you like, hey, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying because compost tea being a, you know, a microbial product that is so varied, every batch is different. There isn't a good way to scientifically control for it and study it. Um, so it would be very hard to get peer reviewed research. And even if we got any, I wouldn't trust it anyway because the batch that I make in my garden is gonna be so different than what that study made that uh, it doesn't really carry a lot of weight. And uh, to make claims around it then would be very challenging uh, because every batch is different. And you do have so many different things going on in terms of the, the microbial interactions, even using very controlled inputs that uh, 
to me, that kind of highlights it. I, I definitely uh, don't want to throw you under the bus here. I just thought that was a good example of sort of the diversity and inability to really control or study something when we talk about living systems. Right. Well, and I think what I get upset about, not triggered, but upset, is <laughs> because I, I, it's not that I'm ever going to say compost tea is a bad thing. My issue is, is the claims that are being made is spray this and you won't have pest issues, do this and you won't have that without anything really to back it up. And, you know, always this question of, well, how do you know you're not brewing pathogens? Because same thing with, you know, insects, it, it, it's a matter of opinion if something is good or bad. And a compost is not sentient to sit there and say, well, today I'm only going to brew the healthy stuff, but I'm going to make sure that, you know, all the, the plant pathogens and even pathogens die. It can't do that. I mean, there are definite things you can do, you know, controlling your inputs and all that to, I would say, steer the boat a certain direction. But mm -hmm. it, it's, it's this idea of black and white does not exist in in really in a lot of the stuff we're talking about. It's so much gray area. And the question is, is does the benefit outweigh the risk? And the idea that a pesticide, a compost tea, again, is only going to do amazing things and never do anything bad. I mean, I would say the same thing of, you know, even pesticides and biocontrol agents, because even sometimes biocontrol agents do naughty things. You know, lace wings, they're awesome and they kick ass. But will they feed on other beneficials? Absolutely. You know, so th there's no absolute in defining this stuff. And I think that with the compost seat, we are just not there yet in understanding them. And for most people, I think the risk can be challenging or the risk is too high that they're going to screw up or get something wrong in there, especially if you're doing edible things like microgreens. I mean, you get any, you know, human pathogens in there, boop, you know, there goes your whole crop and possibly your whole business. I mean, you look at the recalls that happen because of foodborne illnesses and I can already hear everybody saying, well, that's factory farming, blah, blah, blah. It still can happen. I, you know, you just don't hear about the smaller issues with it. So that's it. It's, I'm not going to say compost is bad. I just don't think we're there yet in the understanding. And it is not the miracle cure that I hear so many people, you know, spouting. Granted, you know, is it hurting the environment to do it? No. But I'd much rather have people do that than just dumping out pounds and pounds and pounds of synthetic fertilizer, not knowing what they're doing. Absolutely. But my job is to give, you know, make the grower successful. And, you know, I just, it's, you know, it's inconsistent. So. So two thoughts on that one. I just want to be clear. I have not heard of any, um, any of these outbreaks being caused specifically by compost tea, uh, no, I in agree regards with you. to that. So I just want to, just want to throw that out there. So people don't necessarily make that correlation. I think there right, is right. that possibility if it's brewed improperly or contains pathogens, but I just, you know, usually yeah. I hear about a you know, some sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, dairy up the road that's, you know, putting out a bunch of stuff into the, into the water supply and, you know, manure and stuff like that. And that's where the E. coli comes from, but who knows? And wild um, pigs and bird poop. I mean, there's, and you know, they like to, you know, workers potentially could spread it too, but I've heard some stories about animals are one and it's stuff you can't control. And that's why, um, you know, they have all these falconer guys now that have the birds flying around to chase the little birds, uh, out of the field. So they don't poop in the fields. Yeah. And I, just my last point I want to make on compost tea would be, I would argue that you say we're not there yet. I don't know that we will ever be able to understand that level of complexity, um, or control it. I think that, uh, just like with our soils, I don't think that that's something that we'll ever fully understand or fully be able to control because it is so complex when we start talking about microbiology. You know, hundred years, wrong. I, 100 years ago, they probably didn't think we'd be on the moon in the 60s. So, you know, just saying, I, you know, Fair you think, enough. I mean, Fair I, enough. agree to disagree. <laughs> and, and you know what, with all the genetic work that's coming on where, you know, we're going to be able to do tests to see if things are present by looking for presence of the DNA, we're going to be able to understand a lot more. 
Um, it, it's probably not going to be in our lifetime, but, you know, I think we're going to come a lot further. And, you know, I do believe that, you know, ha- having all these microbial interactions are really important. But again, at the end of the day, I got a grower that's got to produce a crop by a certain date. And if, you know, on flowers and stuff, if those aren't, you know, in bud, ready to bloom like three days before Mother's Day, it's a problem. And so in those kinds of situations, it's just not been consistent enough. Sure, I get that. I I understand the desire to control every aspect of the process. It certainly makes things easier in a lot of ways. Um, and that's one of the challenges with organics and living soils and you know, yep. farming in general, is there's so many things that are out of our control or we're letting go of control of when we start using, you know, or utilizing uh, the microbial loop or nutrient cycling through through these microbes. Uh, or even waiting for your native beneficials to show up instead of spraying, you know, sitting there biting your nails, you know, when's the aureus going to arrive? When's the aureus going to arrive? And waiting for it to happen. It's the same kind of thing. And you just hope that all the, the mother nature's aligns to work like it's supposed to. Um, it, it's nerve wracking. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, I do believe this is the right way we're going. Um, again, I am not anti-compost tea and i i'll say this again i am not a compost tea specialist so i don't know why you drag me into these conversations <laughs> but i just i've been around it enough and the claims that again people make these claims and can't back any of it up well i think i brought it up because uh i know like as someone who's worked in that industry for a long time and is considered by a lot of people to be fairly knowledgeable on the topic Um, Because that's sort of where I cut my teeth in the whole, you know, agricultural, growing horticulture world uh, through my father was learning how to use a microscope and learning about compost tea. It was kind of where I got thrown in. And so meeting you and seeing your reaction, which was actually really common um, when you talk to people who come from uh, an academic background. uh, It was good to have that conversation and realize that we actually shared a lot of the same views um, around around compost teas, um, that was sort of what I was getting at, but there's so many snake oil, you know, thoughts about it, uh, that I I totally understood where you're coming from. And that's where that product evaluation, I think really comes in. Right, right. And I think, I mean, to be honest, we're on the same page on this, except for where we're going to be in a hundred years. Cause I think we'll, we'll, we're going to learn a lot more. Um, and I don't see you out there saying, oh, if you spray compost tea, you'll never have pest issues again. Or, oh, if you spray compost tea, you know, your yield will be 10 times high. You know, I don't see you making those claims. You're living within inside of the realms of reality, um, not trying to push a product. Sure. And I want to stay friends with you too. <laughs> <laughs> so just to, on, on the, for the sake of this podcast and not letting it get too long, uh, I there were a couple of things I wanted to highlight uh, specifically because uh, what we've been talking about has been really general in terms of evaluating products, but um, it definitely varies depending on what we're talking about. So I wanted to highlight a few uh, that I'm more familiar with. So for example, if I was looking at a soil or a compost, the things that I would want specific to those products would be, I would want a chemical analysis. I would want a biological analysis. Again, I want to know what inputs they're using and ingredients in creating this product or process. And uh, I'd also want a, a heavy metal analysis. These are all things that a company should be able to provide you if you're going to be spending money on the particular product. Um, and these are things that I would want to know about anything I'm bringing into my grow, just like testing your water, testing your own soil. Uh, don't take a company's word for it. If, if you can afford, I know this isn't something everyone can afford to do, but if you can afford to do these tests yourself, I think that's really powerful to have a third party analysis of it too. Um, I know I'm always getting tests back, soil tests back from clients uh, that are using our soils. And so I can compare those with our tests and then see, you know, one, what are we putting out there? Um, and, and how do these different tests from different labs compare to what I think I'm putting out there and also make improvements or see where something might've gone wrong. Um, it's just, it's a good tool to use and knowing that chemical analysis, which is when I say that I'm really talking about a soil test or a lab test. Uh, when we talk about chemicals that it's just telling us the mineral nutrient level is, is really important. Is there anything you want to add on just compost and soil in terms of evaluating them that you, that you want to touch on? Uh, no, because again, it's, I mean, it's just not my area of specialty. Again, I mean, I did take composting in college, agronomy, and you know what's really cool? I actually 
found my one of my agronomy professors from the University of Florida, and I messaged him the other day, and he remembers me, which is pretty cool, Dr. Phil Busey um, down uh, in Florida, so that was kind of nice. Um, but, I mean, again, I just know enough to be dangerous, and I just kind of satellite around, and, you know, I don't consult on any of this. I, I stick to my six and eight legs, but I think that the scientific idea applies to whatever it is. You know, whether it be pesticides or bugs. I mean, you just have to go through the scientific thing. And one of the things that my mom always said to me, and I think this is a whole branding thing I need to do in addition to my tinfoil hat. um, I would say something and my mom would say, put your thinking cap on. And does that make sense? And I think a lot of times when somebody makes a claim on a product, stop, put your little thinking cap on. And, you know, does it really make sense that this product you know, could do all this, but not do that. And if it was so amazing, why isn't the whole world using it? That's kind of what I, you know, on these thought processes with some of the stuff, not to say they can't be good products, but people, if they're a good product, they don't need to overstate their claims. You know, I just had that conversation with a grower yesterday because he was asking me like, what do you think about these pH adjusted water for pests? And I know you and I had touched on it briefly, but I just, my thing was, you know, I haven't tried it, but from my experience, I, why have I not seen this in greater, you know, agriculture or horticulture world if this is such a wonderful cure for all, all pests and diseases? I mean, w- would, would the giant soybean farmer rather spend, you know, $300,000 on pesticides or adjust his pH of water and spray his plants where he doesn't need any licensing, he doesn't have to buy expensive pesticides, he doesn't have to worry about liability of spray drift, he doesn't have to worry about pesticide resistance if that worked. Why haven't we been doing this for years? Yeah, it's not a, it's not a perfect answer. I mean, one could argue that we're just, the technology is just now catching up with, or uh, the, the research is catching up with the technology, I guess, if I wanted to say that in the right order. But uh, in general, I think that's a good just a good guide when we're evaluating a product. Um, touching on uh, another aspect of growing though, uh, if we look at biostimulants or uh, microbial inputs, um, what sort of things do you look at when you're looking at those? With the microbial products, uh, the first thing I always wanna know is, first of all, is it alive? Um, because we have had issues with products that are being sold that are not viable. Uh, we're seeing a a bunch of products coming to the market right now that traditionally have been EPA registered pesticides, things like Bavaria and Isaria, but people are now producing them and then selling them as biostimulants so they can circumvent the EPA registration process. And what's interesting, I've actually been looking at some spore counts uh, that actually come from the companies and it does these, these inoculum products um, or, you know, this, this, I guess inoculum is the best way to call them. Um, They definitely do have lower spore numbers in there, but you also have to make sure what they're claiming is in there is actually in there because we did get some products from a grower um, that had bought one of these non EPA registered microbial products. And there are about 15 different microbial things in the product after it was plated out. And so ideally, there should have just been one thing. Like if you buy, say, Botanigar WP and you plate it out, you're just going to get a little series of white fuzz balls, and it's all going to look completely uniform and the same. Um, With these other products, and I'm not saying all soil inoculum or bio, I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm just saying there is an issue with some of these products. And so it's very much a buyer beware. And that's why buying EPA registered products that there's a lot of oversight on that are regularly checked and tested. And there's companies that have been around for decades that are producing them. So they're good, solid companies. And when you contact them and ask, do you have any trial data on how this controls that? They may not have it for cannabis, but they probably will have a lot of good information for other crops and can provide that kind of support to you but it is it is a very buyer beware be very serious aware um because you just don't know what's in these mystery microbial products um uh yeah it's it, it it's it's scary to me and to be honest i think the epa will catch up with some of this stuff 
um, because some of them are making pesticide claims and you cannot do that on these products because they are not EPA exempt. So you're referencing biopesticides, not necessarily all microbial inputs that are no. you know, making claims around uh, you know, increased nutrient cycling, plant growth, yield. Right. You know, phosphorus, solubilization, those sorts of things. Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, no, because again, you know, that's my wheelhouse is the six and eight leg things. But, uh, you know, with, with things like trichoderma, you know, which can help with, you know, nutrient uptake and disease management and stuff too. Yeah, I think that's a product because I've seen that also sold, um, not EPA registered. And I think it'd be very important to... Uh, and, and it is hard for a grower to test it. You know, you can do some quick and easy testing in pre, um, pre-filled Petri dishes that you can buy at Amazon, but all that's going to tell you is if the product's viable. But you have to be very careful because not all microbial products will grow on the, the media in these Petri dishes. I think mycorrhizae is a really good example um, because you just can't plate out mycorrhizae and expect it to grow because I... I I've, I'm, I'm just dangerous enough on mycorrhizae and I've been trying to understand it more. And, you know, I did ask several of the companies, how do you test for viability? Because there's concerns on are, are the products actually alive when you get them? And it was amazing to me how many people couldn't answer from, my, from mycorrhizae companies how you actually test mycorrhizae to see if it's alive. And that kind of is a little bit of a red flag for me. And I'm not saying all products are bad, but I just think that, you know, if you look at products that have a long track record that are being used across multiple industries, that might be a little better than something that's a smaller company that's just been cannabis focused. Yeah, I think microbial inputs are, are tricky for sure. So you mentioned viability, you know, how do we know that they're even viable? Um, how do we know that what's in the bag matches what's on the label? Because technically to make it on that label, they just have to provide one test that shows those levels as a guaranteed analysis from the lab uh, to whatever the registration registering agency is, whether it's but, you know, but WSDA, aren't even CDFA. But the stuff isn't even registered. The stuff that we picked up from the one grower they bought it at a trade show, like from under the table, and it, it didn't even have, there was no EPA register, there was nothing on it. Just here, here's the rate and a date, and that was it. Well, I, that, I wouldn't buy that, but. <laughs> but the problem you know, is, uh, is, is the grower didn't understand that this was a problem. You know, that's, that's until you realize this, they thought that was fine to use, and they don't understand the risk involved with doing stuff like that. And, and it's, it's just coming from, I will, you know, not understanding regulatory stuff and, and risk is, you know, it's not the grower's fault. Um, they're trying to do the right thing. Um, but it's, it's just, it's a really tough situation right now with all of that. Well, we are seeing some testing coming out of the Oregon Department of Agriculture. They've been doing it for a number of years now, and they share that testing. Now, whether or not all the manufacturers agree with that testing is a whole nother, uh, a whole nother podcast altogether. But there is some testing available, so you can go on their website and, and see what results they got. And some products test quite well. Other products test quite differently than what they are purportedly on the label itself. Um, but when we're looking at these microbial products, uh, I think we have, at least for me, if I was going to trial one, what I would do or, or what we've done in facilities is look at, okay, we're going to apply this particular microbial product just to the, these beds here or these plants and see and, and keep those plants separate out. So that when we go to, we go to harvest, we can see if our yield increased um, overall. And if we can say that you know, product X microbial product increased our yield in this facility by 10%, then it would be worth applying because it's, you know, a high value crop. Um, it would be worth using that product. Now, do we know what the mechanism of action was? Do we know that every bottle is, is viable? Uh, the answer would be no to all of that, but we can, we can at least apply some level of control or, or testing or trialing before just applying a product, you know, willy nilly across an entire, entire grow, I guess. I agree with you 100%. The only thing that I'm kind of curious about, I noticed, because so 
and I'm not picking on metarizium, but I'm not metarizium, I'm sorry, um, mycorrhizae. You know, there was a big push into the ornamental greenhouse about 10, 12 years ago for mycorrhizae, you know, for, you know, to use it on everything. And all the growers jumped in. But, you know, my question is, if the mycorrhizae is so good, why do you have other things like cytokinins and then they're mixed in with the product? And how do you know what is actually providing the benefit to the plant? So I get a little leery if there's too many things in the product. I mean, if it's, you know, it should be able to just be the, the, the product you need and not the other things around it. Because I, I wonder sometimes with those tests, if it was a cytokinins given that little push in the plant, because the more I'm understanding about how long it takes for, you know, mycorrhizae to really establish, if you've got the right species and all that, uh, you know, the ornamental crops have too fast of a turnaround time, you know, because the, the ornamental crops are usually, you know, out real fast. And so, you know, that's what makes me think it was actually maybe the cytokinins doing the work and not necessarily the mycorrhizae having time to get established in the crop. Yeah, and I want to I want to come back to mycorrhizae, but one thing before uh, or mycorrhizal fungus. But before I do, the one thing I want to mention too is also microbial persistence. And this idea is like, how long are these microbes staying alive in the soil after we apply them? Do we have to apply them every two weeks? Do we apply them once and never have to worry about again? Now, when we talk about mycorrhizal fungus, uh, and it's interesting because mycorrhizae is actually that relationship between the fungus and the root. So there's a little bit of a nomenclature distinction here, but um, and I know just in, I know just a little bit more to be slightly more dangerous than you on this, but uh, when we talk, you mentioned species, and we talk about that. Well, there's products out there that you you go to read the label. You know, you're trying to do the right thing, and you read it, and you're like, oh my gosh, this has 1.2 million spores of uh, you know mycorrhizal spores in there. And it, but then when you look a little closer, you see that they're you know, for example, if we're growing cannabis and they have high levels of ecto mycorrhizal spores, well that forms a relationship with conifers. That's not gonna do us any good in terms of getting mycorrhizal infection of our cannabis plant. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking, growing, you know, blueberries or azaleas or tomatoes, those, those are gonna be very different mycorrhizal relationships. And so I have to make sure I'm getting the right, uh, you know, mycorrhizal species. And then just to complicate things, they keep changing names. So you'll have Glomus interatices, which is now, you know, uh, Glomus irregularis, which got changed out of the Glomus family altogether. So it became, uh, I believe, Rhizophagus irregularis. So it just gets really, really confusing because you could find any of those names on a particular label. Uh, it's all the same species, essentially, of, uh, of fungus. Now, one other thing to consider there when we're talking about this is you mentioned multiple products in, in there. So you'll see, let's say that product had, you know, 1.2 million spores of ectomycorrhizal fungus. Well, it may have 100 spores per cc of, you know, the, the right glomus endomycorrhizal species for the plant that we're growing, in this case, cannabis. But then it may have 3 million spores of trichoderma in there. And like you mentioned, well, shoot, when we have that much of a difference in uh, the amount of spores in, in a product, how do we know that it isn't the trichoderma that's making a difference? Trichoderma is you know, cheap relative to mycorrhizal fungus. Uh, why are we spending all this money? At the, at, the le at the very least, we're spending too much money. Or we're, you know, we're applying the product wrong. You know, if we just apply the product over the top and it's not coming in direct contact with the roots, now we're wasting our money as well. So there's just so many of these variables that, like you mentioned, that are, that are really important with microbials that I think we have to, we have to really consider. Right. Yeah. And, there, and we're, again, this is something that in the reality, we know nothing about really what's happening. Not for hundreds of years will we understand more, but there is some initial work going on right now, looking at some of the bacilluses and trichodermas and how they perform differently in different media types, because basically they do the they be they perform different in different medias to 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 leave it at that and that's why again why you may see a researcher do a project uh, you do a trial with a product and get great results and then you don't see that out in your facility it could have to do your soil types are different enough that the microbials are uh acting different and by the way while we were sitting here i googled real quick you know plants with non mycorrhizal associations, apparently 29% of all vascular plants are non-host 
for mycorrhizae. So 30% of plants aren't hosts. I thought it had been a lot lower than that. I thought it was like 90 some percent of plants had some some level of mycorrhizal relationship. Um, Notably for those of us that grow vegetables, uh, anything in the brassica family uh, is uh, non-mycorrhizal. So we don't want to be applying uh, it to our kale or our broccoli um, for those of us that are using mycorrhiza in our garden. Yeah. Well, and, you know, from when you say garden, do you mean like vegetable garden or garden garden? Yeah. I'm sorry. Vegetable garden. When yeah. I say garden, I mean And, you know, garden. I do massive tons of vegetable gardening here. But you know what? It's Pennsylvania. You look at the soil and it grows here. So I don't do. I mean, in my seedlings, I add trichoderma just to, you know, prevent a little damping off. But other than that, I mean, my soil is so rich here. I mean, tomatoes volunteer each year from the previous year. It's uh, it's pretty nuts. And then you add in, you know, getting those 11 inches of rain in 48 hours. You know, we're, we're good on water for a while now over here. That's great. That's great. Well, I appreciate your time today and uh, talking about this topic. I just... I just want to uh, caution listeners, you know, when considering whatever product um, that they may be using in their garden, make sure that they're doing this sort of thought process or level of evaluation. Because at the very, at the very, very least, um, they could probably save some money. Even if the product itself works, there may be more effective ways to get the same result uh, using something that might be more affordable. Um, or using less of a product. So you can always be testing things to improve your process, I guess. Right. And, and I mean, I agree with everything you've been saying, Tad. That's why I like you so much. Um, and I, I just, I, you can't, I mean, yes, there's a lot to be said for talking to other people that have done other stuff. Um, and I guess word of mouth is a starting point. But I think it's always good to check the products for yourself and, and do your homework on your products. And, um, You know, I I had a grower comment back to me that, you know, well, they're too busy to to check on details and facts on these things. And I'm like, how can you not be? Because, I mean, this is your livelihood. Or if you're just doing this as a hobby, is it something you're ingesting? I mean, do your homework and make sure that what you're doing is, you know, safe for you, safe for the environment, and you're not wasting money. I mean, that's the you know, the, one of the big things there, I do see a lot of money spent that's not needed. I, I do fully believe in microbial stuff. I, I think with pest management, we're going to see a lot more microbial pest management products coming. Um, I, I mean, I already am pretty excited that we have, you know, several registered strains of a very bassiana here in the United States to use. And so again, the, the, the big guys are getting more involved with the microbials and so they can afford more research. So we'll, we'll get more information on it. Uh, just be, be smart. And, you know, again, wear your thinking cap. My mom will be proud of you if you do. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. And, oh man, I want to sign off there, but I, I really have to ask you this question. With microbials, are you seeing resistance from Uh, insects like you might with traditional chemistries or is that not a problem the same with other like you know predatory insects so when I went and I took that insect pathology course at Cornell and it was taught by the top insect pathologists in the world it was amazing I mean I was fangirling the whole time about these researchers I asked that exact question and they said they have never seen it is it possible yes anything's impossible I mean, anything's possible, but um, it is not something we're worried about. I have uh, an ornamental greenhouse that we rely heavily on biocontrol, and we fog in a cold fogger, which, by the way, I've recently learned cannabis growers don't know what cold foggers are. So, you know, go Google cold foggers, people, and learn about them. Ornamental growers use them all the time, but they cold fog Bavaria once a week, and they've been doing it for years, and we have not had any resistance issues with it. Cool. All right. Well, we'll end on that note because I think that's a really interesting point that I wasn't aware of either. So thank you for your time today, Suzanne. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Anytime. I'm always here for you, Tad. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. You too. All right. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. That was Suzanne Wainwright Evans with Bug Lady Consulting, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. 
You can check out her website at www.bugladyconsulting.com. And don't forget to check out our website at www.kisorganics.com for more information and resources and links to the topics we talked about on today's show. Thanks for listening.